Hey everybody, uh, this, uh, this lecture uh, is coming to you from the, uh, the Painted Moose Tavern in uh, Summit County, Colorado. What? But we're, we're in, we're, we're in Yukon? Okay, everybody, sorry about that. Uh, we're coming to you live from the uh, Yukon territory of the Pacific Northwest and, what? Yukon. Yukon, Oklahoma. Why in the world would anybody want to watch anything from Yukon, Oklahoma? Okay, everybody, sorry about that. Uh, apparently, we're in Yukon, Oklahoma. All right. Uh, it's good to see you guys. Um, I wish. I wish I could see you, but you can see me. Um, so, Mr. Hendricks here. Uh, just excited to get a chance to do a little bit of lecture here. We'll see how this goes. Uh, this will be kind of a, a nice little overview, um, not very specific, and hopefully this, this doesn't run too long for your taste. Um, but a lot of people, are your, uh, a lot of you requested that I, I do a lecture, so here it goes. Um, so today is uh, Wednesday, uh, April 22nd, on this day in history in 1889, uh, the, uh, the, the first Oklahoma land rush uh, began. Um, also on this day in history in 1954, uh, Joseph McCarthy began his hearings uh, looking for uh, commies in the United States Army. Um, uh, also in 1970 was the, uh, the very first Earth Day. Uh, 1994, uh, Richard Nixon uh, passed away. And most importantly, on this date in 1978, the Blues Brothers made their worldwide debut on Saturday Night Live. And that's when I discovered that I was a soulmate. I'm a soulmate. I'm a soulmate. Actually, that's not true because I was only two years of age at the time, but later on I would become a fan. All right, you guys, uh, so before we get started, as, as usual, I would like to uh, start off with uh, good things. So who has some good things to share? Okay, cool, awesome, yeah, great. Yep. Okay, very cool. All right. Yeah? Oh, that's great. Okay, James, I'm going to stop you right there. Uh, honestly, I don't think that we all need to know every single thing you ate uh, during, uh, during quarantine. Um, also, I had no idea that there were that many ways to prepare chicken, but, but thank you. Sorry, a little uh, sixth hour uh, joke for you guys there. Um, anyway, so I'll try to keep the funny coming, but not make it too dorky, okay? Uh, let me, I'm going to share my screen with you all here. Um, we're going to... Go to go to my PowerPoint. Um, okay. So following following World War II, um, we had the largest uh, group of people ever ever born in this country up to that point, known as the baby boomers. We had a massive baby boom. Okay. Uh, more, way more than, than the generation that preceded them, way more than the generation that came after them, which is my generation. Uh, the, the baby boomers were about 77 million people. Uh, and about the time that they started turning 16, 17 years of age, there was a, an automotive executive by the name of Lee Iacocca that said, you know, what we need to do is we need a car for these baby boomers. And the, the, the Mustang was born. Uh, muscle cars had, had, uh, had already been around by the time the Mustang came out in late 1964, but now this thing was, was small, light, uh, fast, and extremely affordable, which was great. Um, the oldest baby boomers, once they started having kids, uh, started driving things like this station wagon. That was a very similar model that uh, my parents had, the Dodge Monaco uh, station wagon, 1979 model. 
thing was a tank. Um, and then for, for some of the, the ones that started having kids a little bit later than that, Lee Iacocca, once again, now working for Chrysler instead of Ford, uh, had them design the minivan, okay? Uh, the minivan was, was very popular for a long time, uh, still is in some cases before giving way to the, to the SUV. Um, why share this? Well, because the, the baby boomers represented a, an extremely large um, uh, group to which to, to market uh, not only vehicles, but, but pretty much everything else you could imagine. So um, the, the automotive industry uh, really kind of grew up uh, and, and changed a lot with the baby boomers. And the baby boomers still to this day represent a very large group to which uh, uh, companies do their marketing. So uh, it, it stands to reason that, uh, that, you know, that they, they are a very powerful force, uh, have been for a long time and, and, and will be, uh, even though they're, they're retiring at thousands per day still, uh, still at this time. Um, okay, you remember these guys? Okay, uh, so you've got, um, up here a little bit. All right. So uh, going from left to right there, you've got Winston Churchill, you've got uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Joseph Stalin. Uh, this was that last meeting that they had together at, at Yalta. Uh, there was a lot of things that were discussed, and it wouldn't be uh, very much longer the guy there in the middle would, uh, would, would no longer be alive. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay, there we go. All right, uh, so you guys read uh, the long telegram, uh, or at least an excerpt from it. I actually, I think I had you guys read the shorter of the two excerpts that I had. Uh, but, uh, but, but George Kennan, uh, writing under the name at the time X to uh, uh, sort of preserve his identity, um, working as a diplomat in Russia, wrote that Soviet power bears with itself the seeds of its own decay. The sprouting of these seeds is well advanced. If anything were to ever disrupt the unity and efficacy of the party as a political instrument, Soviet Russia might be changed overnight from one of the strongest to one of the weakest and most pitiable of national societies. This would warrant the United States entering with reasonable confidence into a policy of firm containment, okay? So we're talking about, uh, talking about containment, all right? Let me switch my color here to, we're gonna do, no, yeah. I'm going to do green. There we go. All right. Firm containment. There you go. Containment policy right there uh, being introduced by, by George Kennan in, in 1946. Designed to confront the Russians with unalterable counterforce at every point where they show signs of encroaching upon the interests of, peaceful, of a peaceful and stable world. Okay. Kennan's, Kennan's telegram, highly, highly, highly influential. Okay. Um, one of the things he said in the excerpt that you wrote that is that world communism is like a malignant parasite which feeds on diseased tissue. Uh, and and that, is, that is very true. So think of uh, you know, Russian communism, Soviet communism kind of showing up uh, in places where economies are stagnant. In other words, uh, the opportunities for people are extremely limited, okay? Um, so think of this, uh, this little swamp right here, that, that water is stagnant, okay? Uh, great breeding ground for, uh, for mosquitoes and uh, disease, okay? Uh, stagnant water. So Soviet uh, communism grows. Communism grows in stagnant economies, okay? Uh, so just, just bear that in mind. Uh, so what we see happen is uh, after World War II, uh, the Soviet Union begins kind of claiming a lot of territory uh, that, uh, that had been areas that they had fought over with, uh, with the Germans, okay, with the Nazis, okay? Uh, and so a lot of Eastern Europe uh, falls under Soviet control, okay? Um, they were, uh, they, a lot of people were having a very difficult time, and we see uh, the Soviet Union stepping in and saying, hey, listen, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take care of all this. And so what we've got right here, grab my laser pointer here again, you've got this kind of dividing line between West and East Europe, okay, uh, with Yugoslavia and Albania kind of being sort of the exception of the rule here, um, and there's a reason why. But this is what we refer to as what? The Iron Curtain, okay? Okay. Um, so Soviet Union shows up and says, hey, listen, you guys are all having a very difficult time. 
uh, your economy stagnates, uh, you know, whatever else is going on. Uh, we would like to, to make sure that everybody gets a share of the pie, okay? Uh, kind of based on some sort of a perversion almost of, of the teachings of Karl Marx, uh, the differences between the haves and the have-nots, okay? So a lot of you see yourselves as have-nots, and we'd like to, for everybody to become haves. So let's take this pizza, for example. Everybody is going to get a slice of this pizza pie, okay? It's like this one. I thought I was grabbing a thought maybe it was a Supreme. Looks like more like a veggie pizza. But anyway, you guys get the point. Uh, and so, so people will go, well, you know, we don't have anything better going on. So, you know, you guys, this sounds like a great idea. Okay. And this is usually how ideas of communism, socialism sort of take form is somebody says, hey, listen, you're not, you're not getting your fair share. We want you to have a, a share of the pie. What the Soviet Union didn't tell everybody is that uh, the Soviet Union was going to take uh, this largest portion of the pie and everybody else is going to be left with this, and they got to divide all that up between themselves. And, and so, really, the state takes everything. Um, of course, the way they sell it to you is that, is that the people uh, get everything. When they mean the people, they mean the government. Um, and really, the government isn't the government. It's really the, the, uh, the Communist Party. It's all about the party. Uh, it's a party for them. It's not a party for everybody else. And everybody's left kind of with that. And so by the time it's divided up between everybody, it's, it's not even, you know, the, this piece of pie is not even worth it anymore. Uh, and so, so Winston Churchill uh, gives his speech uh, at, at, the, uh, um, at the invitation of Harry Truman, okay, President Truman sitting right there at uh, Westminster Col College in Fulton, Missouri. And it's at, in this speech, again, something that I had you guys read, The Sinews of Peace. Uh, we we kind of just refer to this uh, today as the, uh, the Iron Curtain speech. Um, that, uh, that Churchill shares these words. He says, we do understand the Russian need to be secure uh, on Western frontiers by the removal of all poss possibility of German aggression. But here it is, an iron curtain, all right? I even underlined it there. An iron curtain has descended across Europe. Uh, behind the line of that iron curtain lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. These famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I might what I must call the Soviet sphere, and all are subject in some form to Soviet influence and a very high degree of Soviet control. So a uh, little cartoon there, there's, uh, there's uh, Mr. Churchill himself looking uh, under the <laughs> quote unquote iron curtain. Okay, there was not an actual iron curtain, it's just kind of an image that was used. Um, and uh, the, just the, the very fact that that iron curtain is, is descending over the, uh, the railroad tracks here is kind of, kind of interesting. We'll, Maybe we'll get into that in just a second. But uh, so, you know, here's, here's the Russian side. Here's, here's this side, you know, trying to kind of uh, sort of isolate things. Um, I'll, we'll kind of talk about that a little bit more as we go on. All right. Um, so Harry Truman said, I, must be, I'm, I believe it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or outside pressures. Okay. Uh, that was in his uh, speech to Congress, March 12th, 1947. Uh, this is uh, what we just a little snippet of what we refer to today as the Truman Doctrine, okay? Now, why is that necessary? Well, here, here's how this works, okay? Um, we see the, the occupation of Germany following World War II. So, so Germany gets divided into four zones, okay? So this is the British zone, okay? French zone, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the American zone. Uh, the, the French and the Americans kind of shared this little area right here. And then the Soviet Union got uh, the eastern part of Germany. What some people find confusing and why I find this visual helpful is that uh, Berlin is right here. So this little area of Berlin firmly seated, as you can see in the red, in what is eastern Germany, okay? But Berlin was divided much the same way as Germany itself. So if you take a look at Berlin, you'll notice that you have a, on, on the Western side of Berlin, you have the French zone, you have the British zone, you have the American zone, and then the Eastern half of Berlin was, was taken over by, uh, by the Germans. Now, one of the questions I get a lot whenever I show this and, and discuss this with students is they say, well, is, is that when the Berlin Wall went up? No, uh, Berlin Wall doesn't actually come around until the 1960s. However, there, there was a division there. People were allowed to, to cross over uh, between, uh, between each side of the city, but the Soviets controlled that side. The, the, uh, the, ally, the rest of the allies controlled the other side. And 
uh, there were checkpoints that you, that you would go through uh, in, in between those, okay? Uh, sometimes you had to present identification and things like that. Uh, it was very common for people to be living on the east side, the Soviet-controlled side of, of Berlin, uh, and working on the west side. In fact, there was more job opportunities on the west side because of capitalist influence, okay? Uh, and so, uh, but the odd thing about this is, is the fact that, just, just as it's illustrated here, the way that Berlin is situated firmly in East Germany. A lot of us want to picture, okay, well, it would make more sense if it was like, you know, right here along the border or something like that, uh, but it wasn't. And so, uh, so the, the same occupation zones for the city of Berlin or, or what we see with, with Germany as a whole. And so you've got this area, this little island of freedom and capitalism sitting in the middle of this sea of red, okay, where, where Eastern Germany uh, was, was under Soviet control, okay? Uh, and so the Soviets really kind of start separating themselves from the rest of the Allies at this point. They had a completely different agenda. Stalin had a completely different agenda than what, than what had been discussed at, uh, at, at Yalta, than what had been discussed at Potsdam. Um, Stalin was, was bent on world domination and, uh, and, and especially Soviet domination of every bit of, of territory that they could possibly get their hands on, okay? Uh, trying to do everything they could. They, they went into Eastern Germany and they stripped it bare. Anything, anything that was, was left that was uh, usable to build an industrial complex, uh, they, they stripped it. I mean, if it was bolted to the floor, they cut the bolts and, and, and got out. I mean, they, they really did make it so that Eastern Germany really had no opportunities uh, to, be, uh, to be economically sound. And they did the same thing to East Berlin. Whereas West Berlin, who was under, under the, the control of the rest of the Allies, was thriving. I mean, people were going out to eat again. People were, uh, people were working. People were happy. Uh, and then just on the other side of the city, it, was, it, was, it still looked like it was bombed out from, from World War II. Even, even years afterwards, uh, the rebuilding efforts just weren't happening. Okay? Uh, and so finally, Stalin gets a little ticked off and decides he's going to uh, he's going to cut off Berlin uh, from from all outside influence and so the, the roads are blockaded uh, they, they completely uh, block the railroad tracks as I showed you with with that uh, the little Iron Curtain cartoon just a moment ago and th their idea was that they would starve everybody out uh, that the West West Berliners would become desperate uh, and look to the Soviet Union to be their uh, to sort of be their saviors and so uh, the Americans and the British came up with this brilliant idea of the Berlin airlift uh, and so they airlifted supplies um, they were landing planes you know every every what uh, couple of minutes. Um, absolutely amazing what they did and, and the way that they got things organized. Hopefully you watched the video that I shared last week and, and uh, uh, especially the parts with, uh, with Gail Halverson because that dude just cracks me up. Still alive today by the way. He's, uh, he's in his upper 90s at this point but uh, uh, just amazing stories uh, coming out of the Berlin airlift and if you didn't get a chance to watch that video I really recommend that you do. Uh, you hear all about, you know, Gail Halverson being the candy bomber uh, and, uh, and everything else. Just really, really awesome. So hopefully you watch that. Um, uh, again, uh, Harry Truman uh, with his, uh, a reason, there's a reason why I'm revisiting this. Uh, Harry Truman said, I believe it must be the policy of the United States to support, support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or outside pressures. I believe that we must assist free peoples to work out their own destinies, okay? You guys have probably heard me use this term many times before, self-determination, okay? Allowing people to choose their own form of government and everything else. Um, that's, that's the idea of democracy, that's, that's freedom, okay? So I believe, I believe it must be, the, uh, it must be our job to assist free people in order to have self-determination. Uh, I believe that our help should be primarily through economic and financial aid, which is essential to economic stability uh, and orderly political process, okay? So again, the, uh, the, the Truman Doctrine there, okay? So the Truman Doctrine says that uh, one of the things that we needed to do at that time was to support Greece and Turkey uh, with $400 million worth of aid. These were the next countries that were getting ready to fall to Soviet influence. Um, their economies were, were pretty well decimated after World War II. Greece, uh, Greece really took it hard. I mean, Italy and Germany both were just really, really hard on them. Um, and so $400 million in aid was what he was asking for, which, to be honest with you, 
isn't a huge amount of money at that time. Uh, but it was, it was the, the Truman Doctrine specifically earmarked $400 million for Greece and Turkey. Now, the way I always have my students try to remember this, uh, in case it should ever come up on an exam or something like that, is just remember the Truman Doctrine and a greasy turkey. <laughs> all right, the greasy turkey, all right? There's a deep fried turkey there. Mm, well, that looks good, doesn't it? All right, the, uh, so, so just remember Truman Doctrine and greasy turkey, all right? Great way to remember that. Um, all right, so then as a follow-up to that, can you guys tell I wish I was in Colorado right now, by the way? Yeah, okay, I know, I'm helpless. Um, so $13 billion for Western Europe ends up being the, the next step of all this stuff. This is what we call the Marshall Plan. Okay, Secretary of State George C. Marshall. Uh, and so, so $13 billion in aid for Western Europe. Uh, that comes in the form of, and you can see the graph here, uh, raw materials, food and other produce, fuel, machines, vehicles, uh, you know, just, just all kinds of different thing, ways that we helped uh, from 1948 to 1951. Why? Why Western Europe? Well, everybody in Europe is hurting after World War II. Economies have been decimated. Um, so by stepping in and providing aid and allowing uh, basically this $13 billion is, a, is sort of a way to jumpstart the economies of Western Europe. You jumpstart the economies of Western Europe and communism is a whole lot less attractive. So that when S Stalin comes along and says, hey, listen, we'll take over your country, we'll make sure everybody gets a piece of the pie and all that other stuff and you know, kind of selling communism. Um, so when the, uh, the, the virtual communism salesmen come along, uh, everybody in Western Europe says, no, we're good. All right, we've uh, we got everything we need. Uh, the Americans have, have taken care of us. We, we jumpstarted the economy and we're, uh, we are we are well on our way, uh, and so uh, the, the Marshall Plan uh, earmarked a lot of money for Western Europe. But once once a, once a country becomes economically stable and is no longer stagnant, okay, remember the uh, the scummy pond I showed you a moment ago. When they're no long, when they're no longer stagnant, uh, it it really communism looks a lot less attractive, um, and and there's, there's a lot of parts and pieces of this that I'm not sharing. I'm really kind of doing a big sort of uh, overview flyover here. This is, uh, this represents several days of what I would normally do in the classroom with you guys where I would kind of get into that a lot more. Uh, unfortunately, I just don't have the, uh, don't really, well, I just don't really have the time for it right now, but uh, I want to go ahead and move on, okay? Uh, so without economic, without economic health, there can be uh, no political stability or, uh, and no assured peace, okay? That's, that's Secretary of State George C. Marshall there, the Marshall Plan. All right. Um, so you got the Marshall Plan. You see uh, in this cartoon, uh, the upper side there, you know, the, the uh, tractors and farming taking place and all that kind of stuff. And then you see uh, the Mar you see Marshall Stalin plan, right, uh, which is, uh, you know, working the people to, to death and, and uh, um, obviously doesn't work as well. So the Americans and, uh, and the British and the French, we had the better ideas of how things work. Uh, the, the Soviets, Soviets did not, okay? Um, communism, communism and its, its cheaper cousin socialism. Um, take a look at history. It's, it's a lose-lose every time. It's, it's, it's got a 100% fail rate. Uh, why anybody would still identify themselves as a socialist or start espousing socialist ideas, especially, especially in an affluent nation, uh, in, like the United States, I don't really understand because we're not uh, we're not desperate. These these are the these are the tools of desperate people. Okay. Uh, so one of the things we do in 1949 is the formation of NATO. Okay. Uh, so it began with the United States, Canada, ten Western European nations, uh, known as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, NATO has since expanded. Since then, NATO is still around today. Okay. So it's a uh, uh, it's it's a, it's a defense thing. Okay. Very very active. Uh, so mutual military assistance and collective security. Um, the, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR, uh, we, you know, we use all those terms in, uh, interchangeably. Uh, they formed uh, a similar pact uh, uh, with the Warsaw Pact, Warsaw Poland, uh, sort of creating their own version of that. Uh, the United States would go on later to form uh, the, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, or CETO. Um, Things that, uh, that a lot of the uh, Americans probably would have been very resistant to, 
Um, just a few years before, uh, we see that uh, after the Treaty of Versailles and everything else, but now uh, you know every, everybody's kind of all in on this. Uh, so, oh wow, look at that, right? Um, think of think of the Soviet Union and Soviet uh, communism as being like a zombie apocalypse. Okay, uh, th there's there's a lot of different ways you can take care of this, but probably the most effective way is to isolate them. Okay. Uh, so, so isolate the issue. Uh, in other words, we want to contain it. We want to contain the issue uh, and keep it from being able to break out. Uh, so after World War II, the United States uh, kind of becomes sort of the, uh, kind of the police force for the world. Everybody seems to rely on the U.S. to help keep peace. And so uh, kind of take uh, Woodrow Wilson's idea of a League of Nations and expand it and make it into something actually a lot more effective. Uh, and the United States helps to form, uh, with other countries, the United Nations, okay? Um, okay, kind of switching gears here just a little bit. So um, the United States had, uh, oops, uh, the United States had, had you know, used the uh, nuclear weapons, okay? Uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we, we used them. Uh, we know they were extremely destructive. And it was well believed uh, that the, the Soviet Union was many, many years away from being able to develop their own nuclear weapon. Uh, when the United States, when, when we created those, those first atomic bombs, we really were in a, in a race against the Soviets to, to get that done. Uh, it was something that, uh, that uh, Albert Einstein had actually warned FDR about, and uh, hence the Manhattan Project. Uh, the Soviets were working on their own Manhattan Project, and it became very apparent right near the, the end of World War II at the Potsdam Conference that, uh, that, uh, that Truman kind of let Stalin know that he had beat, beaten them to the punch, uh, and Stalin decided to go ahead and double down on their efforts. And they used every method possible, including using a lot of spies to infiltrate the, the U.S. nuclear program. And so on September 2nd, 1949, the Soviet Union successfully tested their own nuclear bomb. Um, we, we, felt, we felt like in 1949 that they were still probably 10 years away from being able to develop that technology. And so it kind of came as a surprise uh, when they had tested that in Siberia uh, in, in September of 49. And so the, the arms race began. Uh, so I've got a little uh, graph here on nuclear proliferation. Uh, so in 1945, the United States had six. Uh, we know we detonated one in the, in the uh, uh, in Alamogordo, New Mexico, uh, and then two over, uh, over Japan. Uh, nobody else had any. Uh, by 1950, we had built up our arsenal of 369. The Soviets had five. Uh, you can just kind of see how it grew from there. And so by 1965, the United States had, you know, darn near 32,000 nukes uh, in comparison to the Soviets, 6,000. And honestly, you don't need very many to... to to create absolute destruction, right? Uh, so, but the arms, the arms race was on, okay? Uh, and so now you have a lot of people are, that are fearing, uh, fearing this, okay? The mushroom cloud, uh, the, the, the possibility of nuclear war and everything that comes along with it, you know, the fallout and all that other stuff. Uh, this, by the way, is a picture of the, um, uh, the hydrogen bomb test that the United States did in the 1950s, the, uh, uh, the Castle Bravo test. Uh, really cool documentary on that. I think it's on YouTube if you ever want to watch. It's pretty. I usually show it, but uh, obviously not right now. Uh, if I can find it, I might share it. Okay. Um, so going back to the UN, uh, which kind of makes this interesting because obviously we're we were in a bit of a uh, sort of a competition with the Soviets. Uh, the Chinese are kind of into the fray here too. But uh, as a part of the, the formation of the United Nations is the, the creation of the UN Security Council. Five permanent members, okay? Uh, the United States, Russia, Britain, China, and France. To this day, that is still the five permanent members of the Security Council. The other 10 members, so it's a 15 member council, the other 10 members uh, are non-permanent. They, uh, they cycle off every couple of years, uh, but these are the, these are the five uh, permanent members. There's a reason why I showed that to you because it'll come up here in a minute. Um, so, Hopefully you read, uh, you, you've been reading in AMSCO, you read about the, the Korean War. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the Korean War. Uh, I will tell you this, that the United States eventually received uh, support in the Korean conflict uh, because uh, the UN voted to do so. And they were voted to do so because at the moment, the Soviets were boycotting the Security Council. Uh, so their vote got overridden. Obviously, China would not have voted for UN support because we were basically fighting China in Korea. Uh, so... Um, the, uh, the, the other three members 
you know, kind of overrode the, the vote at that point, uh, U.S., Britain, and France all voted for the uh, for UN to, to provide support. And um, that's how the United States was able to, to sort of get out of the Korean War when they did. There's a lot to that that I just don't have time to go into. Uh, so really what it ends in is a ceasefire, right? Right there at the 38th parallel. It's still the ceasefire line today. Okay? The, the Korean conflict has never actually been officially resolved. There was no treaty. There's a North Korea. There's a South Korea. Uh, there's not really a border in between. It's, it's, a, it's a ceasefire line uh, that we still to this day uh, patrol. We still help maintain that peace in that region, okay? Uh, we all know about North Korea and you know, Kim Jong-un and you know, being you know, total nuts, okay? belligerent nation and uh, craziness, right? Um, okay, some things that were going on uh, during this time on the home front uh, during the Cold War. Remember, people are afraid of a lot of different things, okay? So remember the Red Scare after World War One. Well, now we're kind of entering into a second Red Scare. Uh, and so you have uh, people being accused of being communists, some of them working in the government. Uh, one such individual was a guy by the name of Alger Hiss, uh, Alger Hiss had been uh, accused by a former communist named Whitaker Chambers. Uh, Hiss was a high-ranking government official. Uh, Chambers had claimed that, he, that he'd seen him at a, at a, a communist meeting, that, that Hiss had exchanged some information with people. Uh, Whitaker Chambers said that he had uh, some information on him that was hidden in a, in a uh, pumpkin on his, uh, on his farm. Kind of crazy thing. Uh, so Hiss ends up going before a congressional committee. Uh, there was a new committee that was formed during this time. Uh, so it was, it was w within the, uh, the House of Representatives. It was known as the House Committee on Un-American Activities, other otherwise usually known as the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC. Uh, and so Alger Hiss gets questioned before HUAC. Uh, they just, I mean, they tear into him. And one particular individual who really, really questioned really hard, uh, kept changing the questions to make it sound like Hiss was, was uh, uh, contradicting himself, was a young California congressman by the name of Richard Nixon, okay? Nixon was trying to make a name for himself, so he was really, really going after him pretty hard. Uh, so the, uh, the, the representative from Yorba Linda, California, uh, that's hard to say, California, uh, known as Richard Nixon. So this is kind of where Richard Nixon comes on the scene. Uh, there's Hiss, uh, Hiss being questioned by uh, Congress, uh, by this point, he was getting really, really tired of the questioning. But nevertheless, the, the, a lot of people are working on trying to find Soviet spies and other things like that because it is well believed that they, that they had infiltrated different parts of the government, different programs. Uh, one, one such uh, pair is, uh, is, is this pair. Uh, this is uh, uh, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Okay. Uh, Julius and Ethel, Ethel Rosenberg. Stop the share here real quick if I can and see. Um, I had a reason why, but uh, well, let's see. I don't even know how to pause my video at this point. Okay, my escape button's not working. Hmm. Escape. Let's see here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I was trying to access my notes because I always have a hard time keeping some of this stuff straight. Okay, so anyway, I'll, I'll go back to the, the PowerPoint here in just a moment, but Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were arrested in 1950 as part of a spy ring that was selling atomic secrets uh, to the Soviets, okay? Uh, there was, there was a, a guy by the name of Klaus Fuchs, and, and Klaus Fuchs was arrested on suspicion of being a spy. Um, this set off a chain of, of arrest because uh, Harry Gold uh, was one of the individuals that Fuchs had, had implicated as being a middleman between himself and the Soviet agents. 
uh, and they were, uh, and, and so he was arrested in the United States. Gold uh, informed on a guy by the name of David Greenglass. Uh, Greenglass was one of Fuchs' uh, co-workers on the Manhattan Project, okay, the top secret, super secret uh, Manhattan Project. Uh, so after his apprehension, Greenglass implicated his sister-in-law, uh, Ethel Rosenberg, and her husband, Julius. And Ethel and Julius, uh, so uh, the Rosenbergs were arrested in New York in July of 1950. Uh, they, were, they were put on trial. The trial was, was a huge trial. Um, they spent 26 months on death row, and they were both executed at Sing Sing Prison in June of 1950. Three. Okay, uh, crazy, crazy stuff. All right, so Julius Nethel Rosenberg, okay. Um, there we go. All right, so they were, uh, again, arrested in 1950 as part of the spy ring, selling, selling atomic secrets. So these were people, there, there were people who had actually worked on the Manhattan Project uh, that, that were contacted by Soviet agents and began selling new secrets. It's one of the reasons why, why the Soviet Union was able to develop their bombs so much earlier than, than, than uh, what was thought. They spent 26 months on death row and then they were, they were executed, okay? Uh, by the way, uh, because they wouldn't cooperate. Um, she was killed first. Uh, followed by him, okay? Uh, th there was a lot of controversy involved with the, the Rosenbergs. A lot of people felt like they had been unfairly targeted. Uh, don't know if you're aware of this. Rosenberg uh, is, a, is a Jewish name. Uh, so some people thought that they were, they were unfairly targeted because of, uh, out of anti-Semitism. Uh, so guy, uh, names like Rosenberg, Gold, Greenglass, and those, those are all Jewish names. Uh, but these were people who had been uh, been, been uh, infiltrated by the Soviets, and, and yes, they actually were guilty of what they had done, believe it or not. Um, although some people have tried to maintain that they were innocent. Uh, so again, uh, we got this uh, second red scare, uh, fear that communists are working with our own government. I already told you about HUAC, uh, and, and basically what happens is people start naming names. Uh, so somebody comes to you and says, "Hey, uh, you, you're uh, you know you're you're a, you're a Soviet spy." And uh, the easiest way to get yourself off the hook on that was to say, no, no, it's not me, it's this guy. Uh, and then to, to point at somebody else. So you end up in this, this time period of people naming names. Um, wait, I don't wanna go to McCarthy just yet. Uh, we, we see this happen in, uh, in Hollywood. Uh, there was uh, some, some Hollywood uh, screenwriters and directors that were accused of being uh, communists. Uh, so people were started pointing fingers at each other. Um, there was uh, there were actually ten who refused to cooperate with Congress, and it was the Hollywood Ten uh, that ended up actually going to prison for uh, for for being in contempt of Congress. Uh, so a lot of a lot of crazy things like that were going on. Uh, and then we see this guy who really rises to the top during this uh, the second Red Scare, and it's, it's Senator Joseph McCarthy. So in February 1950, he claimed that the State Department was full of communist agents. He, he, he had a list. He held up this piece of paper. He says, I've got this list of all these different people in the uh, State Department and, and other, other high-ranking officials. Um, and yet every time you know, somebody asked him to see the list, he wouldn't see it. Uh, when a name wouldn't pan out, all of a sudden a new name magically appeared on it. Um, and so his, uh, his, his witch hunt for communists really kind of came out of his own selfish desire to make a name for himself as, as, a, as a senator. I mean, he had his eyes on something a lot bigger, possibly even the White House. Uh, and so this, this communist witch hunt becomes known as, uh, we, we just call it McCarthyism, okay? Uh, and McCarthy... Uh, McCarthy really kind of believed some of the things that he was doing, but in the other case, it was just, uh, it, it, was, it was a lot of, uh, it was a lot of nonsense, okay? Um, so he says, you know, the reason why we find ourselves in a position of impotency is because the, the traitorous nations of those who have been treated so well by this nation has been less fortunate for members of minority groups who have been uh, selling our nation out. Um, he says, you know, it's glaringly true that in the State Department there are bright young men who are born with silver spoons in their mouths, and the ones who have been the worst, in my opinion, the State Department is thoroughly infested with communists. Uh, but yet he could never prove anything. He says, I have in my hand 57 cases of individuals who would appear to be either card-carrying members or certainly loyal to the Communist Party, but who nevertheless are still hate helping to shape our foreign policy. 
uh, and that was his speech to the, to, uh, the Women's Club of uh, Wheeling, West Virginia. Uh, probably his most famous speech. I mean, the guy's going on TV and having all these hearings and everything else, and, and it, just, it just goes nowhere. Uh, and so uh, McCarthyism becomes this catchword for extreme reckless charges, uh, irresponsible uh, allegations, and there you have it. Uh, so a lot of the world was characterized by fear. Okay, uh, people were afraid of atomic destruction. People were afraid that the, the Soviets were ahead of the United States. People were afraid of communism, and none of that was was uh, that fear gets gets furthered um, not just by the arms race. Okay, so we're talking about the arms race. Uh, you know, who can build the most bombs? Who can, who can build a uh, a rocket uh, powerful enough to carry a nuclear weapon, a nuclear warhead, uh, from one continent to another? Okay, an intercontinental ballistic missile or ICBM. Uh, that, that was a big part of the arms race right there. Who's got the power to be able to do that? Uh, and people's fears were really sparked in, on October 4th, 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik 1. Now this is an artist rendering of Sputnik 1, that's what it looked like. It was, it was, uh, it was a 184 pound steel ball uh, that the only thing that it did was emit a beacon, okay? It was a beep, we call it the beep heard around the world, okay? That's all it did. What, 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 what made people so afraid because of Sputnik is the fact that the Soviets were able to build a rocket powerful enough to launch Sputnik into the, uh, just really just outside of the Earth's atmosphere, okay? A very, very low orbit. But they were able to break the Earth's atmosphere with a rocket. First ones to be able to do it, okay? And everybody was working on this, okay? Rocket scientists were working on building rockets, okay? Uh, and so the, uh, the, the Soviets were the first ones to be able to, to do it. Now, uh, the uh, Sputnik uh, made a couple of laps around the Earth, emitted that little beep, and then it fell into a degraded, uh, a degraded orbit, and it burned up in the atmosphere, and that was it. Yet that 184-pound steel ball that emitted that beeping beacon cast so much fear in people because people were now afraid that the Soviets were somehow more advanced than the United States when it comes to uh, rocket technology and science and math and everything else. <coughs> Excuse me, get dry. All right, so, uh, so in October 57, uh, Walter Lippmann had, had written this, uh, Society Cannot Sit Still. Why is it in the 12 years that have passed since the end of World War II, the United States, which was so far in the lead, has been losing its lead to the Russians? Our people have been led to believe in the enormous fallacy that the highest purpose of the American social order is to multiply the enjoyment of consumer goods. And as a result, our public institutions, particularly those having to do with education research, have been, as compared with the growth of our population, scandalously starved. With prosperity acting as a narcotic, our public, uh, our public life has been increasingly doped and without purpose. Wow, this could have been written yesterday, right? Uh, with the... Uh, with the president and a kind of partial retirement, there is no standard raise to which the people can uh, can repair. Of course, he's he's uh, kind of referring to he's referring to Eisenhower at this point. So the effects of Sputnik. Well, there was this huge fear that we were losing to the uh, to the to the Soviets, to the Russians, and so we see the uh, we see one billion dollars spent to overhaul public education. It was called the National Defense Education Act or NDEA. Uh, Money was spent to increase, uh, increase the, the rigor of mathematics and science, okay? History becomes less important as a subject. Okay, all right, so what do you end up with? A bunch of coaches teaching history. <laughs> That's kind of a joke. Uh, and so, you know, it, so, so a lot of uh, emphasis on, on science and math because there was a fear that uh, the United States was falling behind the Soviets and the Soviets were much more advanced and much more dedicated to this. Uh, we, we see the, uh, the creation of NASA. NASA was kind of born out of a, uh, uh, sort of a, a, kind of a half government agency at the time that was really kind of looking more just to kind of aeronautics uh, and the possibility of satellite technology. Now NASA gets created. Uh, tons and tons of fear uh, coming, coming from people. And so we decided to start spending money to try to rectify that. Uh, we start sending more people to college than we've ever sent before. Uh, there's the creation of uh, federal student loan programs, uh, tons of, of grants that never existed before because we start pushing more and more people towards college and, and away from other 
uh, other traditional skilled labor jobs, okay? And, and we're, we're still kind of seeing the effects of that today. And I've talked to you guys about that a little bit in class on different occasions. So it's really something I don't want to get into at the moment. Uh, and so there's this idea of brewing of mutually assured destruction, the belief that each side would destroy one another. And so that was really what would prevent everybody from using nuclear weapons. Um, to this day, the only nuclear weapons that, you know, that have been officially deployed on other, other countries uh, took place in 1945. Uh, since then, other countries have nuclear capability, but nobody uses them because they know that the other country will retaliate and both will just end up with a big smoking hole and won't be anything left but uh, cockroaches and Twinkies. So uh, mutually assured destruction is why, why people don't, uh, don't use it. Uh, so after, after Truman, our, our president is, of course, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, Eisenhower, uh, the, the architect of D-Day, uh, the hero of World War II, um, the most famous person to ever come out of Abilene, Kansas. Uh, and then uh, his secretary of state was uh, John Foster Dulles. He was a diplomat. He was one of the people who helped organize the UN. Uh, he and his brother, Alan Dulles, were, were very highly influential uh, in, uh, in Eisenhower's government. Uh, Dulles was a, a big believer in brinkmanship. Okay, he believed that communists would only respond if we demonstrated that we were willing to go to the brink of war, uh, and seriously go to the brink of war. Okay, um, he said that the uh, the ability to get into the verge, uh, uh, get to the verge without getting into the war, is the necessary art. If you're scared to go to the brink, you are lost. In other words, it can't be a bluff. You have to be willing to go all the way. And he, and he really believed that, that was the only thing that the Soviets would respond to was a show of force. That was it. Uh, and so the, the idea that he espoused was this idea of massive retaliation, okay? Uh, that uh, the, any, any communist threats would, uh, would be met by overwhelming force, okay? Uh, and so, so under Dulles, or uh, well, with Dulles and under Eisenhower, uh, the United States continued to build up its nuclear arsenal, um, not because we ever thought we would need it, we would need it just as a deterrent, okay? Just as, you know, so they knew we had them, uh, and so they, uh, you know, they, they wouldn't attack us. Uh, Eisenhower really kind of begins the process of using the, the Central Intelligence Agency uh, to conduct uh, covert operations to protect American interests, something that is, is still done today. Again, something I'm probably not gonna have a whole lot of time to get into with you guys. Um, Fast forward a little bit here, uh, after, right around the end of the Korean conflict, we see the death of uh, Joseph Stalin. Uh, with Stalin gone comes a, a new Soviet uh, uh, premier uh, in the form of uh, Nikita Khrushchev. Uh, Khrushchev is, uh, has some big shoes to fill, but honestly is a lot more reasonable most of the time uh, to deal with it than, uh, than Stalin was. Uh, Khrushchev ends up having a really interesting relationship with uh, several, uh, with a couple of different U.S. presidents, okay, um, Eisenhower, uh, Kennedy, uh, Nixon, he and Nixon got into an argument one time when Nixon was, was, uh, was VP uh, over a uh, uh, model kitchen, known as the kitchen debate. Um, so one of the things that we see happen under Eisenhower is uh, the use of spy plane technology. So uh, again, this is something I dedicate usually a lot of time to, and I don't really right now. This is the U-2, okay, known as the Dragon Lady. A uh, really, really odd plane developed by um, uh, Lockheed Martin at their uh, their Skunk Works facility, uh, otherwise known as Area Fifty One. Yeah, uh, no, there's there's no there's no space aliens out there. Just just testing planes out there at uh, Groom Lake, Nevada. Okay, um, so they they developed this plane. This thing can fly pretty much at the the very the very edge of our atmosphere. Okay, seventy thousand feet, uh, and its its primary job is to take pictures. Okay. Um, Again, uh, man, I would love to spend a whole lot of time talking to you guys about the U2 thing. I'm a big fan of it. Yeah, I don't want to talk about that yet. Uh, you know, this, actually, you know what? I'm going to do it this way. This is where I'm going to kind of pause. I, I'm probably going to end up breaking this up into multiple lectures here. So I'm going to talk to you just really quickly about the U2. Uh, the U2, again, super secret, uh, developed in secret by Lockheed Martin. It was all done under, under the, uh, the watchful eye of the Dulles brothers. Um, they contracted with Eastman Kodak to create a, a special camera that could take pictures from really high up. So the, these planes would fly. They recruited these, uh, these pilots uh, out of the Air Force. Um, basically, they, they, uh, you no longer work for the Air Force, you now work for the CIA. They became CIA agents, basically. Uh, they were instructed to fly over these areas, uh, over the Soviet Union, because we had no idea what was going on there. The United States was, was an open book. You could go 
to any bookstore anywhere and, and buy a Rand McNally Atlas and know exactly where all of, uh, all, all of the, the airfields and military bases and major bridges and water treatment plants and dams and you know everything in, in America was kind of an open book. We really had no idea what was going on in the Soviet Union. So we wanted to be able to get a look. Uh, Eisenhower had proposed something to Khrushchev called Open Skies and Khrushchev was like, Nyet. Okay, it's the Russian word for no, yet, yeah, yeah, we're not gonna do that, sorry. And so Eisenhower goes, fine, all right, so we'll just do the U2 program. There was a lot of things that were believed about the U2 at the time. First of all, it was believed that at 70,000 feet, there was no way in the world that the Soviets would ever see it. Okay, that, that it, was, it was above their radar, no, they, they were never gonna catch, it, catch the attention of it. They were never gonna see the darn thing. It was also believed that they didn't possess a, uh, a surface-to-air missile strong enough, a SAM, uh, that could, could knock it down at 70,000 feet. And so even if they did know that the plane was there, they couldn't do anything about it. Uh, it was, since, since there was uh, no official markings on it or anything else, uh, the whole idea was based on a little thing called plausible deniability. If anything ever happened, uh, we could just deny it. Uh, the plane was equipped with, uh, with, with explosives uh, behind the, the pilot seat to self-destruct. Um, the pilot was instructed never, never to get captured. Uh, in fact, the, the plane was actually rigged to explode once it, if the pilot ever did have to eject. Uh, if the pilot did eject successfully, they were not to be captured. They actually had a, a coin in their pocket. It was a silver dollar uh, that uh, could be broken, and uh, there was, it actually exposed a needle Oh, the very powerful uh, toxin that would that would uh, kill you in moments, um, and that was great because they, they thought, okay, you know, the, the plane will get destroyed. Uh, the the no pilots ever going to get captured alive, and so we have plausible deniability if anything like this ever happens. And then on May first, nineteen sixty, something happened. Okay, May first, May Day, nineteen sixty. Um, Francis Gary Powers, uh, the, the pilot, was flying, uh, flying one of those missions over the Soviet Union, taking pictures, when uh, the, uh, Nikita Khrushchev was alerted that those darn Americans, I'm cleaning that up a little bit, are flying that plane again. Uh, in fact, Sergei Khrushchev, his son, actually wrote this in, the, in his memoir. Um, and uh, they knew about the plane. They always knew about the plane. We, we, never, <laughs> we were never fooling them with the plane. Uh, they knew about it. May Day in the Soviet Union was a big deal. It was a, it was a major day for a military demonstration and everything else. And so flying over them on May Day was kind of like, a, uh, was, you know, sort of like them doing something to us on the 4th of July. Uh, and so they decided to go ahead and shoot the plane down. So a surface-to-air missile exploded close enough to the plane that those big wings on it, by the way, the wings are really, really floppy in order for it to be able to fly at that high of an altitude. Uh, the pilot has to wear like, basically like a space suit. Um, it exploded close enough to it that it was able to, to knock the, the plane's power out and cause it to fall into a flat spin. Um, Powers uh, worked and worked and worked to get himself out of the plane and did. He was able to, to eject and was able to float down safely, uh, but was too much of a coward to uh, uh, take his own life upon landing on the ground. Uh, the plane didn't blow up the way that it was supposed to, so a lot of it was still intact, uh, including the camera system and everything else. So through diplomatic channels, uh, Khrushchev reaches out to Eisenhower and says, hey, we have your plane. And Eisenhower's like, uh, what plane? What, the, the, what plane? There's no plane, right? Um, and he's like, hold on a second, let me get back to you. So they talk about it. Like, like, he's like, All right, gets back to him and says, okay. And, and I'm paraphrasing and fast forwarding through a lot of things here, but just kind of giving you the, the nuts and bolts. So Eisenhower basically says, well, um, yeah, sorry, we had a plane that uh, was doing weather research and it drifted over, over the Ural Mountains into, uh, into your territory, and we're really sorry about that. Uh, if, if we could have the remains of our pilot, uh, that'd be great. Um, and and uh, Khrushchev is basically like, no, you, you don't understand. We have your pilot, okay? He's alive. He's talking, okay? Uh, they had the plane. They, they, they could see the, the, the camera system on it, everything else. They... Uh, uh, they weren't being fooled by anything. And so uh, plausible deniability has now gone out the window. You know, they've got a, they've got a, a walking, talking pilot and, and uh, all the evidence that they need to, to prove what's been happening. And the, the sad part about this was that Khrushchev and Eisenhower were supposed to meet that summer and to talk about a lot of things uh, and kind of start trying to work on sort of, sort of uh, 
uh, kind of breaking down the, the nuclear programs, sort of slowing, slowing down nuclear proliferation and kind of get on the same page. And uh, Khrushchev called the whole thing off. Uh, he was mad and it ticked off. And, and uh, when we had to work on trying to uh, do an exchange between, of spies in order to get uh, Gary Powers back, uh, which was uh, uh, kind of a convoluted sort of thing. Uh, by the way, if you ever want to see a really good movie on that, uh, there's a movie with Tom Hanks was made by Spielberg just, just, just a few years ago uh, called Bridge of Spies. Uh, great, great movie. So uh, if you want to watch that, it's kind of, kind of fun. So um, anyway, that, that's kind of where I want to leave off for today. I, um, I really have no idea um, uh, where I'm at time-wise on this recording. That's one thing, I don't, I don't have a running clock on this. I should have done that. But uh, I do want to, to, to do this again. And so I'll probably uh, create another one for, for next week. But uh, hopefully that, that helps you guys out a little bit, uh, kind of understanding a little bit of this. Uh, we'll, we'll continue with uh, uh, talking about how things operated under, under Kennedy and Nixon, uh, maybe even get into Carter and Reagan uh, when I do this again. So um, again, guys, I miss you all so much. And um, um, this has been a tough time, really has. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's something you get to tell your grandkids about, I guess, right? Um, so uh, with, with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and sign off, and uh, I'll, I'll get you guys another one of these uh, here in the next few days, okay?